so I think we've spent a good amount of time discussing the the calorie restriction problems and all those confounding variables, and we see parallels and and again all sorts of other research. But I want to talk about some of the other conceptual situations here and problems with this thinking of you know thinking of things in terms of hormesis as we've kind of been pointing out. So a couple of the other things we had always already pointed to as far as support for hormesis. One is that you see over time in aging and degenerative conditions, you see reductions in adaptive responses. So you see, to be more specific, you'll see reductions or defects in autophagy. And you see this in obesity, type 2 diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, liver disease, any sort of degenerative condition. You're going to see impairment in autophagy. You also see maybe in a lot of cases, you'll see lower levels of uncoupling. And I'm assuming things like lower levels of mitochondrial biogenesis, things like that. And so what you're pointing at here is a is a problem with the adaptive response. And I've and so this is again by people in favor of hormesis, they'll point to this and say, if you have less autophagy and let's say diabetes or heart disease, then more autophagy must be better. It must be the opposite of that state. And so we should just do things to increase autophagy. And there's just a log- logical fallacy, a logical problem here with that that extrapolation, that assumption, which is that basically just because you have defects in an, ad- in an adaptive response does not mean that increasing the stimulation of that adaptive re- response is beneficial or does the opposite. In fact, it, well, we'll get to it in a second. But so so it doesn't mean that 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 is inherently beneficial. It just means that in a degenerated state, you are not able to adapt as well, and that also kind of conflates with the other view from the the hormesis side, which is that when you block these pathways, if you block the ability to have autophagy in response to various stressors, or if you block the ability to uncouple in response to various stressors or anything else, then you don't respond to the stressor as well and potentially cause degeneration. And again, same thing here. No, there's no, uh, like we don't disagree that you need to be able to adapt properly to stimuli, but that doesn't mean that the stressors are beneficial. It just means that a reduction in proper adaptation is harmful. And some rather direct support for this is, so you see in all these degenerative states that you have reductions in the adaptive responses, but you also see increased reactive oxygen species in these states. And reactive oxygen species are the trigger for that adaptive response. So you still have the trigger, but the response is not happening, which is a suggestion that we don't need to be activating the trigger more. We don't need to be forcing oxidative stress and adding more stressors to increase these pathways. We instead need to fix the ability to adapt to these pathways and whatever is causing that problem in adaptation and that defect in adaptation. So there's just, a, again, a complete logical fallacy there that in you know in this hormetic idea, we want to be increasing the exposure to hormetic things to increase these adaptive responses to reverse aging and degenerative conditions even though you already have excessive amounts of oxidative stress in these conditions and they're not and you're not responding well in these conditions and another problem with this view is there are beneficial specific effects to exercise and fasting and whatever else and you see benefits of those interventions in these states you see benefits from exercise in these states you see benefits from uh you know from fasting in these states, calorie restriction in these states, all those things. And if you were arguing in favor of hormesis, you would have to argue that the reason you're seeing these benefits is because of the stress and oxidative stress specifically and lack of energy that they're causing. But these states are already characterized by low energy and excess oxidative stress. So that state you're only driving further. In that case, it doesn't make any sense to claim that the reason why you're having these benefits is for the increases or due to the increases in oxidative stress and energy depletion but rather they're due to specific effects, which is our whole argument. And I know I was throwing a lot of words and terminology in there. So if there's any, I don't know if it came across clearly or if there's anything you want to kind of sum up there to help me out, Mike. Well, I was just going to put a lens to it, which is essentially, it's like with these chronic diseases, what I kind of see is I look at it through Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome. So an issue you have alarm and then you have resistance and then you have fatigue. So a lot of the chronic diseases in my perspective are kind of, or at least a way to look at it is that their people are in the fatigue stage. Their body is not able to mount that adaptive response effectively anymore because it was already adapt, like trying already mounting that response over an extended period of time. Right. And when you look and when you look at like, like the, the view there or the, the model there of with which to look at these things is you have like a litany of stressors 
simultaneously. So you have poor sleep, you have smoking, you have poor diet, you have job stress, um, you, and then you have, you know, immobility, whatever it is, or, or injury. Um, and so you have all these things going to the bucket and the body is desperately trying to maintain some degree of homeostasis, right. To manage itself, to maintain, um, its general function. And so it relies on all these adaptive pathways. And then eventually you exhaust the adaptive pathways. Mm -hmm. Once you exhaust the adaptive pathways, then you just get like, then that's you. And you you'll see that, but at the, at the exhaustion period is then you just see like these frank chronic diseases where the adaptive pathways are kind of blown out and things just start, things start to degrade. So like a lot of the markers or indicators that we're looking at, like cholesterol or, triglycerides or any, or these different, whatever they are, whatever lab value you're looking at, cortisol, prolactin, um, those are all indicators of these adaptive responses. You're, because the, and it, the other lens that I like to look at things through with this is that you have, like the body is intimately connected to the environment all the time. There's no separation, but there's, everything is responding to everything else. And so you have this like constant, like give and take, give and take, give and take, give and take, give and take. And the body is essentially like the cells of the body have come together to maintain an overall environment. And so you, it's, they need the resource, you need resource to do that. And over time, if you don't provide resource and you increase expenditure of that resource because of whatever you have going on, not to mention you have factors going into the system that are impairing the ability to use the resource, then you just get like frank breakdown. And that's what you're seeing with heart disease. That's what you're seeing with cancer. That's what you're seeing with all the chronic diseases. And they all run through the same pathways. All the research is saying, oh, it's inflammation. It's, it's oxidation. It's inflammation. It's oxidation, whatever it is. That's why you need antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. It's all the common stuff. It's everyone, it, and then where you see these science magazine articles where it's like, oh, inflammation is the new killer, like whatever it is. <laughs> so I, I think that, um, yeah, I think, I think it's important to look through the lens of alarm resistance fatigue and then like a constant interplay where you have to give resource to the system and remove the negative factors on the system and this is again opposite of a hormetic response which is you need to apply a stress to get an adaptive response what we're saying is you need to minimize the stress and provide a resource to deal with the stress that you already have going on instead of just keep applying stresses Keeping applying stresses on a system that's already broken and unable to adapt to the stress is a horrific idea. <laughs> it yes. doesn't make any <laughs> sense. And, it, and it, this becomes important. And this doesn't mean that exercise or something like that is bad. And it doesn't mean it, it, it means that there's a context for exercise. If you have somebody who's a frank diabetic with heart disease, it's understood that you're not going to have them squat 400 pounds today. Yeah. Well, beyond that, too, it also like the, the key point there, and just to interject, is that the exercise is not beneficial because of the stress, right? Yes. If exercise is beneficial in type two diabetes, which is already a state of very, very high stress on that cellular level, then, and then adding, it wouldn't make sense for adding more stress to somehow all of a sudden be beneficial. Instead, the exercise is beneficial for other reasons. 